anyway, today it, it's kind of a fun session. I'm not introducing Josh, but I'm introducing the topic. And, and he came up with this idea, and I thought it was a great idea. And it's right in line with what he likes and knows a lot about. He's just going to take you through the Supreme Court in two hours from beginning to present day and do it by era and by time period as opposed to just by topic. And he came up with this concept because he's got like 10 new ideas every day of his life. And uh, I can't keep up with all of them. But uh, yeah, it, it should be fun. And uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Without okay. further ado, so it's all yours. Uh, <laughs> Gibson said, it's been an absolute pleasure teaching all of you. A uh, very lively discussion. We've covered a lot of ground in a very short period of time, so I figured the only way to end this class is to cover everything else we missed. <laughs> it's essentially the entire corpus of constitutional law in about two hours, and I hope you'll bear with me. This is going to be a little bit more of a dis lecture than discussion. Um, if you do have questions, just put them up there and I'll try to get to them. But uh, if any of you have seen the list that I put up on Angel, um, I spent basically a full day uh, going through the entire U.S. reports from beginning to end picking up all the cases that I thought were pretty important, and there were about 300 of them. And what I actually did was I plotted them chronologically, starting really from 1793 and going all the way down to 2011. Um, and I've even included cases from, case from this year. Um, why did I do this? Um, we discussed judicial review in this class from the very beginning. We talked about Dr. Bonham's case, where uh, Lord Cook said that he if something is nugatory to uh, the, the Constitution of England, it cannot be constitutional. I was talking about Marbury versus Madison, where, where uh, Chief Justice Marshall asserted for the first time that the courts had this power of asserting the will of the majority. And we talk, go into the present, like a case like Citizens United, which we talked about briefly, where there's charges of an activist court siding with corporate interests to promote some uh, abstract concept of free speech in, in the face of these corrupt elections. Um, and, and really, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything kind of repeats itself. And by looking at all these cases on this kind of continuum, we see it very clearly. Uh, one quote just to leave you with, to start you with. Um, in Citizens United, his dissent, Justice Stevens said, the only relevant thing that has changed since Austin and McConnell, which were previous First Amendment cases, is the composition of this court. Now, that's where I want to start with. Is that true? Is the only thing that changes the nine people on the court? Or is there something else? Is there something deeper or more profound that the Constitution is actually trying, that the court's trying to accomplish? So, uh, first I'm going to talk about how I, how I divide this up. Uh, there are about eight or nine categories that I use. Um, civil rights, criminal rights, economic and property rights, employment, First Amendment, both speech and religion, federal courts, federal power, that refers to the power of the federal government to do stuff, federalism, which kind of refers to the balance between the states and the feds, and individual liberty. And at various points throughout our nation's re republic, those kind of uh, topics have kind of ebbed and flowed, it's like a sine wave, where at certain times it was very big on criminal rights, and other times it was very big on uh, federal courts. And I want to just take you through this chronologically. Now, the first set of cases, uh, the, the, the first period I like to talk about uh, is really the founding of the Republic. We talk about 1793 through about 1856, which leads us up right to about the Civil War. And this was an interesting period because the Supreme Court had only been established around 1790, 1791. But, but originally there was nothing good happening. Uh, in fact, many people turned down appointments to the Supreme Court because no one wanted to be on it. There was nothing, there were no good cases. Um, and really the first uh, important Supreme Court common law case was Chisholm v. Georgia, which if you studied was a case where a person in Georgia sued the state of Georgia for, for some damages. Uh, and this, this more or less spawned the 11th Amendment. But this was the first time where a Supreme Court case was so important that actually people took notice of it and they actually had a constitutional convention to fix or remedy what happened in Chisholm v. Georgia. Uh, but what you'll see is a lot of the early cases in the early 1800s all dealt with federal courts. What I mean by that is the jurisdiction. Before the court could actually assert itself as a body to actually make constitutional law, that actually asserted itself as a body that actually had this power. And this was really the brilliance of John Marshall. John Marshall, as we discussed at length in Marbury, uh, basically established that the courts did have this power to uh, assert what is and what is not constitutional. And we saw in other cases like Strawbridge v. Curtis and Ex parte Bowman, uh, where the courts decided what kind of people can get into federal courts. Strawbridge talked about diversity jurisdiction. Um, Ex parte Bowman actually established the Supreme Court's habeas corpus jurisdiction, that they could actually hear habeas petitions. Um, uh, Martins v. Hunter Lessee, this was a case that said 
uh, an appeal from a state Supreme Court can actually go to the United States Supreme Court. These were all cases that kind of just laid the bare framework of how cases would make their way. Um, in addition, they also, the Supreme Court was very important in deciding boundary type disputes. Uh, we often think of the cases with the Indians as tragic uh, uh, instances of civil rights where basically these people had their land taken from them and they were just obliterated. But at its core, it was about property. It was about land. The Union wanted the land and the Indians wanted it and they were fighting for it. Um, in the case of Jonathan B. McIntosh, which was one of John Marshall's opinions, he basically said that the Indians uh, actually were savages and according to the laws of nature, they did not have any kind of inherent property rights in this land. It was really for the white Christian people. Uh, and this was essentially a reflection of the time where uh, the white people think they have this manifest destiny that they can take the land because they're simply better. Uh, John Marshall actually regretted that opinion. He actually publicly said, I wish I never wrote that. And later in the Cherokee Indian case, in one of his clash with Andrew Jackson, he actually backed off from that and actually found ways that the Indians could protect their land. So this is a way that the courts can involved in property disputes. We also have a case like McCul um, sorry, uh, Gibbons v. Ogden, which was really a dormant commerce clause case. That was a case with the steamboats, where one guy in New York had a steamboat and someone in New Jersey. This was really a way to flesh out where the sovereigns of the state could uh, uh, intersect from one to the next, that the people in New Jersey couldn't tell people in New York what to do and vice versa. That would have been you know, a situation. Um, and and that, that was one of the ways that the court asserted itself very early on. Uh, Baron v. Baltimore was another similar case that said that the Bill of Rights does not apply to the states. That's basically saying that the states are still sovereign in this sense. We have this, this shaping of what is federal and what is state, and, and there was like this fluidity for the first 40 or 50 years. Um, uh, but this all really came to a crashing halt when the Great Compromise collapsed. The Great Compromise being the Slavery Compromise. As you know, when the Constitution was first ratified, uh, slavery was left in, uh, namely because there's no way that they could possibly uh, ratify the Constitution if slavery had been taken out, if it had been banned. Um, but everyone at the time realized that this was on a collision course, that eventually that the court would have to confront this sooner rather than later. And this is really what I think, what I call the Republican crisis mode, from about 1857 to about 1872. Um, this is a time when, when things were really, really, really dicey. Um, it all started with, of course, Dred Scott v. Sanford. Um, Dred Scott's an interesting case for a number of reasons, because at its core, as much as Dred Scott's about slavery, as much as it's about individual liberty, it's about diversity jurisdiction. It, it was essentially a civ pro case. If you actually read the opinion from the Missouri Supreme Court in Dred Scott, it has to do with diversity jurisdiction. Um, we read in diversity that if you're a citizen of one state, soon a citizen of another state, you can use federal courts. Well, citizen, hello, is a African American a citizen? And that was really the, the crux of the entire case. And while, uh, while Tony's opinion really focused on whether a black person could be a citizen or a slave be a citizen, this or that, the entire case was whether someone could avail themselves of the federal courts. That this question which we keep addressing, can someone use the federal courts to vindicate their federal rights? This issue that keeps popping up was really the crux of Dred Scott. Dred Scott was also interesting in that Roger Tawney, who was from Maryland, um, thought he could avert the Civil War by holding this. He wanted to prevent this armed conflict. He thought, well, if I write this opinion, it will appease the uh, Southerners and perhaps will make a state of peace that we can have something that maybe in the new territories, uh, you know, there'll be free states, but the old territories will be slavery and we can have this kind of peace. He was trying to be a diplomat. He was trying to kind of split the difference. Um, that failed, ethically. Um, Dred Scott was 1857, um, and this case uh, set the abolitionist movement, the abolitionist movement of flames. Um, in a sense, it's a popular constitutional that's worse. We had a case where the Supreme Court was interpreting the uh, Constitution, and people did not agree. Um, Abe Lincoln said, um, if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irre irrevocably fixed by the decision of the Supreme Court, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers. He basically said that it's not just the Supreme Court's job to interpret the Constitution. Um, and Lincoln, as I'll get to in a moment, was very big on interpreting the Constitution for himself. So we see what happens here is we have Marshall, a really smart guy, who realizes if I tell Jefferson what to do, he's going to tell me to get lost. And you have Tawney, who says, hey, I'm smart. I'm going to tell the Supreme Court what, I'm going to tell the United States what to do, and it backfired big time. Because what happens is when the Supreme Court loses the so-called will of the people, the people rebel. They don't like to be told what to do. So there's always this, this tenuous relationship between the majority will and the will of the Supreme Court, how they have to balance it, because they have neither the power of the uh, uh, sword nor the purse, so they can only rely on the will of the people. So we have Dred Scott, and shortly after Dred Scott, we had a succession crisis where South Carolina, Fort Sumter, they fired upon uh, Union troops, and that was basically the start of the, of the Civil War. 
which was probably the most gruesome battle we've had on, on this nation, um, and it was devastating. Um, now getting to the part where not just the Supreme Court interprets the Constitution, Abe Lincoln had his own view of what executive power was. Um, you're probably familiar with his ex parte Merriman, which actually wasn't a Supreme Court case. It was decided by Judge Roger Taney, sitting as a circuit justice in uh, Maryland. And it, what happened was Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus. He said, I can lock you up for any reason without any check. And as you know from the Constitution, there's a suspension clause. The su suspension clause is only Congress. Congress can suspend the Constitution. So we have the situation where Abe Lincoln basically said, I'm going to do this anyway. And then you have the Constitution which says you can't. And you have Roger Tawney says you can't. Then what did Lincoln do? Yeah. Thumb just knows that Tawney said, I don't care. I don't give a damn. We are a nation at war. We are a house divided. If I do not do this, we will fall. Keep this in mind when we get to the Bush years. Same doctrine. Or very similar doctrine. So we have Abe Lincoln basically telling Roger Tawney to, to F off. It, it doesn't matter what you want me to do. Because I have a war to fight. And that's ex parte uh, Merriman. We have a similar executive complex uh, case a few years ago, ex parte Milligan, where this is in 1866 that basically uh, the, the, the hostilities of the Civil War had basically uh, ended more or less in, in this part of the country. I think it was in Indiana. And a, a general there actually wanted to try a, um, a, a person for some sort of military crime, even though the federal courts were operating. Um, and in this case, the Supreme Court actually pushed back and they said, well, if the federal courts are operating, you have to try in the federal court. You can't hold a court martial. Uh, but at the same point, the the uh, Congress didn't like this very much. So in 1869, you have ex parte McCardle, where basically Congress tried to restrict the jurisdiction of the federal courts so they could try people in these kind of military tribunals. And then the Supreme Court said, "Oh wow, they're serious about this." And they said, "Okay, you can do it. Whatever." If you read McCardle, it's a very weak opinion. But they basically, you can read it. They're basically saying, "Okay, Congress, we tried to tell you what to do. You didn't like it. You win." and they kind of just push back. So there's always this give and take between the executive branches. Keep that in mind when we get to the Gitmo cases with Hamdi Boumediene, where basically Congress told the Supreme Court to do, and the Supreme Court told them to, I don't give a damn what you think. And the one more case from this period, which is Texas v. White, this is actually an interesting case of whether secession is constitutional. Uh, you had some bondholders who were trying to recover money uh, that the so-called Republic of Texas sold, and the Supreme Court basically said that Texas was never a republic and the money had to be paid, it wasn't sovereign. Uh, so now we begin what I, what I would like to think of as kind of like a third wave. And this is from 1873 to give or take 1932. Um, the big deal in 1868 was the 14th Amendment. This revolutionized the way constitutional law uh, works. Th this changed the ballgame. We talked about the early years with federalism with Barron v. Baltimore, McCulloch, and all these other cases. What exactly is the relation between the feds and the states? We have the 14th Amendment now. That, that changed the deal. Um, and there were a couple of big cases that, that um, relied on the 14th Amendment. But let's just put this in a historical backdrop. We're in 1868. Reconstruction. The radical Republicans are running Congress. Um, the southern states are basically in a state of shambles. Um, and more or less as a condition of their reentry to the Union, the northern states basically twisted their arms that if you don't ratify the 14th Amendment, you can't come back to the Union. So it's questionable, I mean, as a matter of... Uh, Ethically, is the 14th Amendment valid in that sense? I mean, uh, the southern states, they didn't agree to it. And even if the people representing the states agreed to it, they weren't properly elected. There were no fair elections. It was kind of just a, a ramshod way of getting this thing approved. But prove they did. And we now have the 14th Amendment. Now, what happens with the 14th Amendment is the Supreme Court doesn't quite like it right away. Um, and it's very contentious. Um, even though the, the 14th Amendment was supposed to revolutionize this federal-state relationship, the court was very resistant to this change, um, perhaps reflecting the fact that not all the country agreed with this, that there were still many people, especially in the South, who weren't big fans of this new federalism, so to speak. So I take you first to the 1873, 1873 up here, which is the slaughterhouse cases, which you should be familiar with if you follow con law recently. But this was a, a case based out of New Orleans, where New Orleans opened up a... Uh, New Orleans passed a law saying um, if you want to slaughter beef or any animal, any livestock in city limits, you have to do it in this one place. You can't open up your own slaughterhouse. Um, a bunch of butchers in New Orleans said, like, said, well, that one butcher is basically a favorite by the government. They're getting all this business, and 